We're here at NASA Dryden Research Center. Bill, can you tell us a little bit about the plane behind us here? Yes, this is the uh, Northrop HL-10. It was one of the lifting bodies that was uh, flight tested here at Dryden uh, back in the 1960s. Uh, the idea was that when for spa possible spacecraft re-entering, if you put wings on them, they might burn off. So the idea was to have a spacecraft that had no wings but was able to land like an airplane. So the lifting bodies were tested here at Dryden to see whether or not that uh, operation could actually work. And actually it did. There were a number of them flew here, uh, the Northrop M2, F2, and uh, the Northrop HL-10. The success of the M2F1 encouraged NASA headquarters to approve development of heavyweight lifting bodies which would be launched from the B-52 and powered by an XLR-11 rocket engine. Although the lightweight M2F1 could simulate the low lift-to-drag ratio, it could not simulate the high speeds that a heavyweight vehicle could achieve. The initial program involved building two different vehicles, the M2F2 proposed by NASA Ames Research Center and the HL-10 proposed by NASA Langley Research Center. The first flight of the M2F2 occurred on July 12, 1966, with NASA pilot Milt Thompson at the controls. From the start, it was apparent that the M2F2 had handling problems. Several times, the aircraft rolled back and forth violently as it descended. Each time, however, the pilot was able to regain control. Despite these problems, flights continued through the remainder of 1966 and into the new year. While the M2F2 was cautiously expanding its envelope, NASA pilot Bruce Peterson piloted the first flight of the HL-10 in December of 1966. Peterson discovered that the vehicle was barely flyable. Only by keeping the HL-10 speed up was he able to maintain control. This first flight, in the words of Langley engineers, once again demonstrated the value of flight tests as proof of concept. The vehicle was grounded while engineers at NASA Langley and Dryden could come up with a fix. Uh, actually, I know the test pilot, Bruce Peterson, who made the first flight of this airplane. He said it was kind of interesting because they dropped him from under the wing of a B-52. He didn't have an engine, so he started exploring. So he was just falling like a brick. Lifting bodies, because they don't have wings, tend to have a fairly high uh, drop rate. So he said, okay, this is the first flight. Everything looks good. Let me do a practice landing. So at 10,000 feet above the ground, he basically did a simulated landing only to have the vehicle turn over on its back. And he said, well, this isn't good because I'm still falling like a brick and I'm going to have to land. So basically what he did was he did some rapid modifications to the gains on the flight control system. And as he explained later, added about 20 knots for mom and the kids and made a very high speed landing on the lake bed. But he saved the vehicle. It was nine months before they found out, before they perfected everything, but after that, the HL-10 was actually one of the most successful lifting bodies they had. Although the HL-10 was grounded, the M2F2 program pressed on. Other pilots joined the program. In May of 1967, during the 17th flight of the M2F2, the handling problems came to a head during a violent crash. The M2F2 was significantly damaged and the pilot, Bruce Peterson, was seriously injured. Peterson eventually lost an eye to the accident, but otherwise recovered. This accident became the opening scene for the 1970s hit TV series, The Six Million Dollar Man. Following the accident, the vehicle was rebuilt in-house by Dryden technicians and renamed the M2F3. The most significant change was the addition of a center fin, which greatly stabilized the aircraft at low speeds and solved the recurring problem of poor lateral control. Analysis of flight and wind tunnel data from the first HL-10 flight suggested flow separation on the outboard fins. 
After the leading edges of the outboard fins were modified, the HL-10 made its second glide flight in March of 1968, and now handled as well as an F-104. In February of 1970, Air Force pilot Peter Hogue took the HL-10 to a speed of Mach 1.86, the highest speed reached by any piloted lifting body. That same month, NASA pilot Bill Dana took the HL-10 to 90,030 feet, the highest of any heavyweight lifting body. What an amazing story. And there's other planes here, too. Yes, That's and good. we're going to take a look at them today. Okay. NASA Dryden here is located on the edge of Rogers Dry Lake, which is the largest dry lake on the surface of planet Earth. It's uh, basically where the space shuttles came to land and where the X-1 and X-15 also came to land. The speed of aircraft increased dramatically during World War II. After the war, the quest for speed continued, but was stymied by a sound barrier, an aerodynamic phenomenon that resulted in loss of aircraft and pilots. The wind tunnels at that time could not provide accurate data near Mach 1, the only means available to understand the unknowns facing pilots at transonic and supersonic speeds was to build specialized research aircraft with enough structural strength to withstand the unknown forces. With its ideal flying weather, the Muroc Army Airfield in Southern California was the perfect location for operating these research aircraft. Rogers Dry Lake, with an area of 44 square miles, served as a runway that stretched for miles in any direction. In September of 1946, the first group of engineers from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, arrived at Muroc. They were to assist the Army Air Force in a supersonic flight program involving the XS-1. Their new home was much different than the one they had left in Virginia. The facilities were as rugged as the desert landscape. Initially named NACA Muroc Flight Test Unit, the staff had a single hangar and lean-to offices, while housing consisted of wartime barracks. Some personnel left due to the harsh conditions, but those who stayed established a tradition of innovation and creativity. This scene represents somewhat of the history of Dryden and the traditions of the research that's been done here. On the right is the X-1E, which is actually one of the original XS-1s that flew in the 1940s. It was converted later in the 50s to do further research by putting a canopy on it with an ejection seat. Nevertheless, it did important high-speed aeronautical research here at Dryden. The Bell XS-1 its fuselage, patterned on the lines of a 50 caliber machine gun bullet, was designed to fly at speeds in excess of Mach 1. The Air Force, with NACA support, conducted an accelerated test program with the first X-1, with the goal of quickly reaching Mach 1. The rocket-powered XS-1, later redesignated X-1, was carried aloft by a modified B-29. As the B-29 climbed to altitude, the XS-1 pilot entered the cockpit. On the historic day of October 14, 1947, Captain Charles Chuck Yeager, seated in the XS-1 as it dropped away from the B-29, lit the rocket engines. As the plane accelerated, it pulled away from the P-80 chase plane, trailing a long white contrail. As the speed increased, the Mach meter needle passed 0 0.98, then suddenly jumped off scale, signifying supersonic flight. Captain Yeager had become the first person to break through the sound barrier, piloting the XS-1 to Mach 1.06.
NACA flew the second X-1 in a more cautious step-by-step buildup program. Herbert Hoover, not the 31st president, became the first civilian NACA pilot to reach Mach 1 on March 4, 1948. Originally painted orange, the X-1s were repainted white for better tracking visibility against the blue sky. This remains the case even today for most research aircraft. The X-1 program laid the foundation for NACA's and later NASA's flight research. Other aircraft exploring the transonic region of flight included the Douglas D-558 Phase 1 Skystreak and Phase 2 Skyrocket in a joint NACA Navy program. The Phase 1 was a conventional 1940s design with a turbojet engine to explore the transonic regime. Vortex generators, seen now on many military and commercial aircraft, were first developed on the D-558 Phase 1. The D-558 Phase 2, in contrast, was a swept-wing aircraft designed to explore supersonic flight. Though turbojet, turbojet and rocket, and rocket-only versions were built, the rocket-only version of the D-558 Phase 2 launched from the B-29, was much more productive gathering supersonic research data. Though it was against NACA policy to set speed or altitude records, Scott Crossfield convinced management to attempt an assault on Mach 2 with a D-558 Phase 2 rocket-powered skyrocket. In preparation for its record flight at the edge of its envelope, the Skyrocket was fitted with engine nozzle extensions for more thrust. The skin was waxed to reduce drag and the aircraft chilled to allow more fuel to be carried. On the cold winter morning of November 20, 1953, after the Skyrocket dropped from the B-29, Crossfield lit the rockets and climbed to 62,000 feet. Flying a perfect flight plan, he piloted the D-558 Phase 2 to its maximum speed of Mach 2.005 and became the first man to exceed twice the speed of sound. Versions of the X-1 continued to perform high-speed flight research. The most notable one now sits on a post in front of the main building at Dryden. It is the X-1E. It was modified in-house from the first NACA X-1 to conduct research on very thin wings at high speeds. It first flew in December 1955 and continued Mach 2 flights to the end of 1958. While the rocket-powered aircraft attracted much of the public's attention, these were not the only research vehicles being tested in the 1950s. Some of these revolutionary vehicles looked rather strange, even by today's standards. I'm standing in front of a full-scale mock-up of X-15 number 3. The X-15, which flew starting in 1959 and flew through the 60s, was the most productive experimental high-speed rocket aircraft in the history of aviation. It was the first airplane to basically uh, reach and survive Mach 3 and above. It reached a top speed of Mach 6.7 and reached an altitude uh, basically of over 300,000 feet. Making it the true bond between the airplane and the spaceship. It was dropped from under the wing of a B-52 at approximately 40,000 feet. A 50,000-pound rocket motor lit off, and then the, the uh, pilot basically piloted the vehicle to the edges of space. They flew so high that they were above most of the atmosphere so that they no longer, the flight control surfaces no longer worked like an airplane. They had to use small rocket motors such as the space shuttle and the Mercury spacecraft used in order to control the vehicle during its ballistic trajectory. It would travel 200 miles from its drop point to Edwards in less than 10 minutes to give you an idea. And then it would land as a glider out on the lake bed. It is considered by many to be the most successful program ever. 
There was only one fatality. This is a tribute to the number three ship, which crashed, uh, killing Major Mike Adams. That was the only fatality of the program. The fastest flight of it <clears throat> was flown to Mach 6.7 by former California State Senator Pete Knight, who passed away uh, recently. But his aircraft is on exhibit at the National Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. The number one aircraft is on display in the Milestones of Flight exhibit in the, uh, National, Muse uh, in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. As the quest for speed and altitude continued, the Air Force, Navy, and the NACA, later NASA, contracted with North American Aviation to build a new vehicle. This new vehicle, the X-15, would probe the hypersonic speed regime, that is, faster than Mach 5, and perform flight research at the edges of the Earth's atmosphere. To perform its mission, the X-15 structure was made from a nickel-chrome alloy called Inconel X. It could retain its strength up to a cherry red 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature that would melt aluminum and make stainless steel useless. The X-15 was powered by an XLR-99 variable thrust rocket engine with a thrust range from 28,000 to 57,000 pounds. Before each flight, the pilots trained eight to 10 hours in a ground-based simulator. The X-15's flight envelope demanded precise control during all phases of flight, the powered phase, the flight out of the atmosphere, and especially the re-entry. The pilots trained for the multitude of possible malfunctions of the rocket engine, systems, and displays. The appreciation of the ground-based flight simulator was fully realized first in the X-15 program. A flight began with the pilot climbing into the X-15 attached under the wing of the B-52 on the ramp. The B-52 then taxied out and took off, slowly climbing to 45,000 feet, heading for the northeastern corner of Nevada. Once there, the B-52 turned back toward Edwards and launched the X-15. Once clear of the B-52, the pilot lit the rocket engine and began his particular flight profile, climb for altitude, for instance, or a speed run. In spite of launching in northeastern Nevada, the X-15's flight to Rogers Dry Lake lasted an average of just 10 minutes. The engine consumed the entire fuel supply in less than two minutes, after which the airplane was a high-speed glider with a lift-to-drag ratio of about four to one. The pilot was busy the entire flight and had very little time to enjoy the scenery. Things happened fast at Mach 5 Plus, and this was no airplane to fall behind on. Maintaining a proper angle of attack was critical if the pilot was to reach the designated altitude. Under and overshooting were startlingly easy, and both had a dramatic effect on the final altitude reached by the aircraft. The bottom portion of the ventral fin, the vertical stabilizer underneath the aft portion of the fuselage, was too tall to permit landing with it attached so it was jettisoned moments before landing, then retrieved and used again. The X-15 had no brakes for landing, just two skids that popped out at the aft end of the fuselage and a nose gear with two wheels that was not steerable. The X-15 came down quickly and its pilot had only one chance at landing, as do shuttle pilots today. For its record speed flight, the X-15 was fitted with two external propellant tanks which could be jettisoned and covered with a silicone ablative coating painted white. 
Unlike the shuttle tiles, the ablative absorbed the additional heating from the high speed by charring rather than insulating. Even then, surprisingly, shock impingement around a dummy ramjet on the lower ventral tail caused some serious local damage to the skins. The ablative coating proved to be impractical for a reusable re-entry vehicle since the old coating would have to be stripped and a new coating reapplied for each flight. With flights starting in 1959 and extending to 1968, it was and still is considered the most successful of all experimental research aircraft. The X-15 program added to the historic foundation of aerodynamics, sometimes measurably, often intangibly, in ways that were not imagined. It pushed the piloted records to an altitude of 67 miles and speed to Mach 6.7. Eight of the 12 X-15 pilots earned their astronaut wings. The X-15 provided much new insight into the once feared region of flight outside the atmosphere. It also gave engineers critical data on the unique challenge of re-entry. Re-entry compounds the effects of aerodynamics and spaceflight maneuvering and proved to be more demanding of both pilot and aircraft than anything encountered before. Many of the mysteries of re-entry flight were solved by the X-15. The X-15 rocket engine uh, was very unique. It's a 50,000 pound thrust rocket motor, but what makes it different is it's fully throttleable like a jet engine. Most rocket engines either are on or off and you can't throttle them. This was a very sophisticated rocket engine. Even for today, it would be so. You notice the airplane is not awfully big. Almost all of it is fuel uh, forward of the rocket engine itself. And it got rid of all the fuel in four or five minutes. From the, that time on, it was strictly a glider. The way the airplane landed, because it was a glider, basically, was it had a nose gear which was blown down just before landing. On the back, you'll notice the very large ventral fin on the belly. The lower part of the ventral fin was actually jettisoned in flight. A little parachute lowered it to the ground without denting it too badly. And then a pair of skids were explosively deployed and it landed on the lake bed. That's why we had to land on the lake bed because it would have cut a groove in our concrete runway. So uh, the X-15 landed uh, again like the space shuttle at about 230 to 240 knots. This is another one of the lifting bodies from the 1960s. Uh, some of them were called like the flying potato, the flying flat iron. This one was known for obvious reasons as the flying bathtub. It's the M2F2, another Northrop design. In sharp contrast to the high speeds and altitudes of the X-15, a strange looking vehicle appeared at the center. The low-speed M2F1, a lifting body vehicle, had no wings and resembled a bathtub. A Dryden engineer, Dale Reed, sought to validate this new re-entry concept with a manned research aircraft. Rather than using a ballistic re-entry trajectory like a Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo capsule with very limited maneuvering range, a lifting body vehicle had an estimated landing footprint the size of California. The tubby vehicle shape was taken from re-entry lifting body shapes that were being tested at the NASA Ames Research Center. After seeing Reed's two-foot model fly, Center Director Paul Bickle authorized an in-house effort to build the manned M2 F1. In the spring of 1963, Milt Thompson made the first flight of the M2F1 towed behind a hot rod Pontiac Catalina convertible. Later, an R4D Navy DC-3 was used for tows to higher altitudes. Flights released from behind the R4D at 12,000 feet lasted just two minutes until landing. The M2F1 would lead to bigger things in the future. For people who watch television or remember a television show called The Six Million Dollar Man, uh, a later version of this particular one was the one that ended up tumbling across the lake bed. 
uh, after uh, a hard landing when the landing gear was only partially extended. Nevertheless, it, it was a landmark in uh, developing the idea of having shapes that without wings could still develop lift. It requires a high landing speed, but nevertheless, the lifting bodies proved that it could indeed be done. It just so happened that the space shuttle was developed that had wings. As we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Apollo landing this year, this vehicle actually represents an important milestone in the history of that program. It's known as the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle. It was developed here at the NASA Flight Research Center in order to gain experience on flight control laws for landing a lunar excursion module vertically on the moon's surface. In the center of the vehicle, you see what looks like a large jet engine. That jet engine offset five-sixths of the weight of the vehicle because the gravity on the moon is only one-sixth that of Earth. So that jet engine basically simulated the gravity on the moon. The little rocket engines attached to spheres you see around there represented the rocket engines that the lunar excursion module was going to use to slow down from lunar orbit and actually land on the surface of the moon. Sounds simple, but anyone that's ever played the lunar lander game knows it really is not that easy. This was a very valuable research tool. It was so valuable as a research tool, they ordered further ones to be built to train the astronauts. If the M2F1 was strange, the lunar landing research vehicle was out of this world. During the 1960s, NASA had embarked on a journey to the moon. The Apollo program's mission was to land men on the moon and return them safely to Earth. No one on the Apollo program wanted the first lunar landing, with its high pilot workload and psychological stress, to be the first time an astronaut team flew a lunar landing descent profile. To help train astronauts for this difficult task, Dryden engineers Don Bellman and Gene Matranga, along with Bell Aerospace, conceived of an in-flight simulator to train the astronauts. It became known as the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle LLRV. The LLRV was a free-flying simulator held aloft by a turbofan jet, simulating the moon's gravity and maneuvered with hydrogen peroxide thrusters. First delivered in late 1964, the LLRV was flown by the Dryden research pilots Joe Walker, Don Malik, and the Army's Jack Kluver. During that time, the team made significant modifications to the craft, some to better mimic the lunar module in its layout, others to make the vehicle safer or more capable. Perhaps most significant of all, the vehicle was a pure fly-by-wire craft controlled by three analog computers with no mechanical backup. During its 198 flights at Edwards, it had flown as long as nine and one half minutes and reached a maximum altitude of nearly 800 feet. It was then turned over to Houston in December of 1966 for training the Apollo astronauts. Picking up some dust. As they say, the rest is history. On July 20th, 1969, former Dryden Center pilot Neil Armstrong set the Apollo lunar module down on the moon. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Neil Armstrong described this vehicle as being one of the most important factors in him being able to maneuver the lunar excursion module away from a boulder field and land in a clear area. He said this vehicle really helped immeasurably. Of course, Neil also had to eject from one of these vehicles because they weren't the world's safest vehicles, but nevertheless, it was a real help for the Apollo program. This 3-8 scale mock-up of the F-15 represents advances in aeronautical research uh, pioneered at Dryden in the 1970s. Basically, the idea was for very high-risk testing, rather than risking a human pilot, you would have a remotely piloted vehicle 
where the pilot was on the ground controlling it. This particular uh, F-15 was dropped from under the wing of a B-52 in order to do uh, dangerous high angle of attack spin type testing. Uh, by testing it on a remotely piloted vehicle first, you could get an idea of how the real full-scale F-15 was going to operate before you actually risked a test pilot. On the side of the airplane, you'll notice a number of markings which represent how many missions this, uh, this vehicle successfully made. Sometimes it was recovered in the air, sometimes it actually hit the ground, but nevertheless, uh, it was reusable, so you could repair the dings on the skin and then send it up again. The mission markings on the side represent the number of sorties uh, where the vehicle was actually dropped. Uh, one of the symbols there represents the fact that uh, they were unable to retrieve it in midair. The helicopter made two passes and was unable to uh, recover it, so the remotely piloted pilot basically had to land it on a lake, on a uh, road here in the Antelope Valley. So after that, they put skids on it just in case they had to make uh, another emergency landing. But it goes to show that when you're flying a remotely piloted vehicle, you can do things that if you were actually in the airplane, you'd think about ejecting first. So this was kind of a, an advance in the 1970s, which uh, basically we're pursuing today with the remote use of unmanned aerial vehicles and remotely piloted vehicles. Behind me is something from the 1970s. Is this is the HIMAT, which was basically uh, a remotely piloted research vehicle that was developed with a very unusual configuration of wings, canards, and uh, tail fins in order to see about the idea of advancing technology to produce an extremely maneuverable jet fighter of the 1980s and 1990s. Because the configurations were so unknown, they decided it would be useful to build a remotely piloted vehicle in order to do research before they built a full-size aircraft. You'll notice the skids on the, on the ground. This vehicle was designed to be dropped from a B-52. A turbojet engine would start. It would do all its maneuvers. Then a, the test pilot who was at the controls on the ground would actually land the vehicle on the dry lake bed, similar to the way the shuttle and the X-15 did. But in this case, of course, the pilot was safely on the ground monitoring things through a television camera that is approximately where the front of the canopy would be on the high mat. New technologies for fighter aircraft were also being tested in this decade using two small remotely piloted aircraft called HIMAT, highly maneuverable aircraft technology vehicles. Only 23.5 feet long, it featured a closed coupled canard and an aeroelastic tailored composite wing, technologies used later in this decade on the X-29. The digital fly-by-wire control system used an autopilot to fly precise maneuvers to gather large quantities of quality data in a short time. HIMAT research brought about far-reaching advances in digital flight control systems, which can monitor and automatically correct potential flight hazards. The HIMAT successfully achieved its goals of a 100% increase in aerodynamic efficiency over 1973 technology and maneuverability that would allow a sustained 8G turn at 0.9 Mach and an altitude of 25,000 feet. By comparison, at the same altitude and speed, an F-16's maximum sustained turning capability is about 4.5 Gs. As a tribute to the HIMAT contributions, one vehicle now hangs in the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum. So this program took several years, was fairly expensive, but it was the beginning of remotely piloted technology that we're using today in the 21st century. Okay, uh, this is a lineup of aircraft that have been involved with the history of Dryden over the years. The first one is the F-104 Starfighter. It was originally used as a chase aircraft for the X-15 back in the 1960s. Uh, later it was used to do some experiments because it was capable of reaching Mach 2 while carrying uh, experiments, some of which involve such things as the shuttle tile experiments. 
The next aircraft is the X-29. It's not obvious from this angle, but this is one of the few uh, jet airplanes that was made with forward swept wings rather than aft swept wings. It was uh, flown in the 1980s here to see whether or not it was now possible with the advanced composite technology that we were coming up with to uh, if there would be any benefit in flying jet fighters with forward swept wings. So the uh, test program was quite successful, but no one seems to have built anything with forward swept wings since. The X-29A forward swept wing program marked the return of the X-planes to Dryden after a nine-year absence. The two-phase program ran from 1984 to 1992. The first phase concentrated on the proof of concept at low angles of attack and high speeds. Two X-29A aircraft were built as technical demonstrators to test a forward swept wing with advanced composites, variable camber, and a thin supercritical airfoil. Also tested was highly unstable and highly augmented multi-surface controls that required an extremely high gain triple redundant digital control computer with analog backup. The fiber strands of the composite aeroelastic tailored wing on the X-29A were specifically aligned to allow it to twist under load. The twisting relieved the loads at the tip, preventing structural divergence or breakage at high speeds. The digital flight control computer system provided sufficient artificial stability and predictable handling qualities in a very unstable aircraft. Moreover, its supercritical wing contributed to good maneuvering and cruise characteristics in the transonic range. Despite these accomplishments, the predicted higher lift-to-drag ratio did not materialize, being about equal to or slightly less than the then-current fighter aircraft. The X-29 also represented the beginning of computer technology for flight controls. Uh, the uh, X-29 was so unstable that without computers, the time to double amplitude of, uh, say, a pitch pulse, without the computers working, the pitch pulse would double in amplitude within a tenth of a second, making the airplane essentially completely unflyable except for the uh, computerized flight control system it had. This airplane on the surface looks like a Navy F-8 Crusader, which was a Mach 2 uh, fighter basically of the early 1960s. However, in the 1970s, this airplane was modified with the first digital fly-by-wire flight control system where the pilot actually gave controls to a computer and the computer actually manipulated the control surfaces. Uh, this was revolutionary for that time, although nowadays almost every modern jet fighter, for instance, and even the airliners have that. The first flight of the F-8 digital fly-by-wire aircraft in May of 1972 by NASA pilot Gary Creer ushered in a radical new flight control concept. Until the conception of the F-8 digital fly-by-wire vehicle, mechanical systems which range from steel control cables to hydraulics had been used to transmit a pilot's stick and rudder inputs to the control surfaces. Although some electronic fly-by-wire systems had been flight tested, these aircraft still retain the mechanical links as backup, the lunar landing research vehicle being the exception. By the late 1960s, digital computers had become more available and offered a lighter, more capable and flexible fly-by-wire system. Dryden engineers proposed such a digital system be developed and flight tested. The computer initially used was from the Apollo 15 command module digital computer but was later replaced with three AP-101 general-purpose digital computers. These were state-of-the-art computers in the mid-1970s. Each had 32K of memory, operated at 0.48 megahertz, weighed nearly 48 pounds, and cost $130,000. This system demonstrated fault tolerance by continuing normal operation after certain computer failures. 
The amazing contributions of the revolutionary F8 digital fly-by-wire program were quick to follow. Today, fly-by-wire is used in almost every modern aircraft, including fighters, bombers, transports, and airliners. The airplane, in addition, turned out to be a godsend for the space shuttle program. The first time the space shuttle Enterprise landed on the runway here at Edwards, it actually got in a pilot-induced oscillation and almost went off the runway. They modified the fly-by-wire F-8 to duplicate the flight control system of the Enterprise and discovered there was almost a half-second time lag, which to a pilot doing a high-gain task, a half a second can be really fatal. So as a result, they were able to modify the flight control system of the space shuttle long before the Columbia ever flew. So as a result, the space shuttle uh, exhibited really excellent handling characteristics in its fly-by-wire flight control system, partially due to this airplane. The approach and landing tests of the prototype orbiter Enterprise brought a level of attention to Dryden that exceeded even that of the X-15 era. The Enterprise was to be launched from the back of a modified 747 airliner, with the orbiter gliding to a landing. The Approach and Landing Test, or ALT, would validate the vehicle's low-speed aerodynamics and systems, including the orbiter's fly-by-wire control system. Early in the morning of August 12, 1977, tens of thousands of visitors streamed onto Edwards Air Force Base and lined the east shore of Rogers Dry Lake to view the first free flight of the shuttle. After taxiing from the mate demate device and taking off from the main runway, the Orbiter 747 combination climbed to 30,000 feet. With the Orbiter on its back, the 747 went into a slight dive and the Enterprise gently separated. As the 747 banked to the left, the Enterprise banked right and glided to a successful landing on Rogers Dry Lake Bed. Two more free flights were made in the following months, each one with the aerodynamic fairing installed on the aft end of the Enterprise intended for use during ferry flights to Kennedy. On the fourth flight, the orbiter's fairing was removed and the descent was steeper and faster than on earlier flights. The fifth and final free flight in October 1977 was to demonstrate a safe landing on the Edwards main runway instead of the lake bed. Each side of the runway was lined with employees and guests of Dryden for a closer view. The release and glide were uneventful, but as Enterprise neared the runway, a problem surfaced. The fly-by-wire computer system had a slight delay responding to pilot commands, and rapid control inputs led to a pilot-induced oscillation, or PIO. At landing, the vehicle touched down on the main gear, then bounced back into the air. It touched down again, and bounced again more shallowly, then touched down again, and coasted to a stop. Needless to say, the spectators along the runway, including Prince Charles, got more than they had expected. This PIO tendency was soon corrected with a Dryden-developed PIO suppression filter, that is, software changes to the flight control computer. Here, the F-8 digital fly-by-wire vehicle proved to be invaluable, testing various solutions until the best one was determined. Three and one half years later, in April of 1981, the excitement at Dryden was at a fever pitch again, with tens of thousands of spectators lining the east shore of Rogers Dry Lake and a thousand or more news personnel scattered around, a loud double sonic boom signaled the return of the Space Shuttle Columbia back from a two-day mission to space. Edwards Air Force Base was and continued to be the primary landing site for the Space Shuttle until 1984. 
Since then, Edwards is considered the primary backup landing site for the shuttle. Okay, this is another example of an F-8 Crusader, but this one is modified externally a lot more than the other one. This is a supercritical wing. Uh, basically, in the 1970s, a theory was advanced that in order to reduce the drag of a high-speed airplane, you should shape the cross-section of the wing differently than the traditional high-lift wing that had been used ever since the Wright brothers, basically. Uh, as a result, you have an unusual shape on the wing, and in order to test this in flight as opposed to in theory, basically they built a supercritical wing and mounted it on top of the F-8 Crusader and confirmed the advantages of having this odd-shaped wing. Most airliners that you see today that cruise at high Mach numbers of 0.9 and uh, above, for instance, are using supercritical wings. So this airplane as a test bed actually led to an important advance in aeronautical technology. Another F-8 was also flying at Dryden during this time, the supercritical wing aircraft. The supercritical wing grew out of Richard Whitcomb's innovative research at the Langley Research Center. The wing featured a flattened top surface with a downward curve at the trailing edge. The flattened top reduced the tendency to generate shock waves and the downward curve at the trailing edge restored the lift loss by flattening the top. The first flight of the F-8 supercritical wing was made in March of 1971 by NASA pilot Tom McMurtry. The flight test data confirmed wind tunnel results that the wing had lower drag than conventional wings at speeds just below Mach 1. The reduced high-speed drag offered increased cruise speed, improved fuel efficiency, and a longer range. In the decades since, supercritical wings have appeared not only on airliners, but fighters, heavy transports, and business jets. The structure you see in the distance that looks like an erector set was used to lift the shuttle after it had landed here at Dryden. It was lifted into the air, then a 747 shuttle carrier aircraft was towed underneath it, then the shuttle was lowered and bolted to the top of the 747 for its flight uh, back to uh, Florida. This represents the active NASA fleet today in use uh, here at Dryden. Uh, the F-18 Hornet and, the, and to some extent the F-15, but mainly the F-18 Hornet, have replaced the F-104 as chase aircraft. In addition, uh, some F-18s have been modified to do aeroelastic research, and they even have one F-18 that was modified to basically simulate an unmanned aerial vehicle to refuel from another F-18 hands off by the pilot. So this, again, represents cutting edge research for the future, and it's the sort of thing that NASA is involved in today out here at Dryden in the Antelope Valley. F-18 Active Aeroelastic Wing, or AAW program, investigated the benefits of aerodynamically twisting flexible wings to improve roll maneuverability of high-performance aircraft at transonic and supersonic speeds. Three, four. This wing warping concept is similar to the technique the Wright brothers used on their early flyers. The F-18's wings were modified to increase their flexibility by replacing the wing covers with thinner ones. Leading edge flap actuators were added to the wing to operate the outboard segments separately from the inboard segments. To accommodate these changes, the flight control computer software was modified Conventional use of control surfaces at high speeds can result in unfavorable wing twisting and reduce control from a phenomena called aileron reversal. AAW used the outboard leading edge flaps and existing ailerons to impart the aerodynamic force necessary to provide the desired roll force. Complete, 
AAW control technology can substantially increase control power and reduce aerodynamic drag and aircraft structural weight in future aircraft. A derivation of the self-repairing flight control system program a decade earlier, the Intelligent Flight Control System, or IFCS, flown on a highly modified F-15, incorporates the earlier program's self-learning concepts into flight control software. Using a neural network, it is capable of manipulating far more control surfaces at a faster rate than the first-generation self-repairing flight control system. Engage. Failure. <laughs> failure. But IFCS technology is capable of more than simply making a damaged aircraft flyable. For example, intelligent flight controls could lead to rapid prototyping of aircraft control laws. The Autonomous Formation Flight, or AFF, program extended the symbiotic relationship of migrating birds by exploiting the performance benefits of aircraft formations. The traditional V formation allows all birds but the lead to reduce drag and conserve energy. Using differential GPS to guide AFF pilots into position, a NASA FA-18 flew in the wing upwash generated by a lead FA-18 and demonstrated a 14% fuel savings at cruise altitude, better than the project goal of 10%. And strong, strong effect right there. Started to uh, roll the right slightly. The Automated Aerial Refueling Project, AAR, an outgrowth of the Autonomous Formation Flight Program, evaluated the capability of an FA-18A aircraft as an in-flight refueling tanker for unmanned air vehicles. The project focused on developing accurate analytical models derived from actual flight test data to aid in development of an autonomous aerial refueling system. Okay, this one's very smooth and it's not deviating left or right at all. Copy. Get positive closure, a little low, coming up, coming up. She's got it, she's got it. The first ever autonomous probe and drogue airborne refueling operation was successfully performed on August 30, 2006 by the Autonomous Airborne Refueling Demonstration, or AARD project. Okay, we're in. Pilots were on board the receiver FA-18 for safety purposes and to fly the aircraft to initial test conditions. No, you need to come in another 10 feet. A global positioning satellite-based relative navigation, coupled with an optical tracker, provided the precise positioning required to put a refueling probe into the center of a 32-inch basket dangling in the airstream behind an airborne tanker. As a testament to the autonomous system, Dryden pilot Dick Ewers and flight test engineer Marty Trout assumed a look-ma, no-hands position on the final refueling demonstration. Okay, a nice smooth closure of the basket, slightly moving. As important as high. the successful engagements, the system also identified and safely recovered from each missed attempt. Okay, it detected a miss and came back on its own, so I did not do anything. Okay. Projects like the AFF and AARD have helped to establish Dryden's leadership in autonomous aircraft development and flight research. She's got it, she's got it. And here we are still at Dryden, home of advanced aeronautical research. It goes, just goes to show that there's still a place for propellers even the, in the 21st century. This airplane is actually sort of like myself, a Vietnam veteran. It was designed for audio stealth during the Vietnam War. It had a special, special propeller, special engine geared very low so that it could fly at very low altitudes, low, low speeds, and the enemy would never even know it was there. So it was a reconnaissance airplane that basically flew in the dark over the enemy at night in Vietnam. So uh, this is a recent arrival here at Dryden from Ames uh, Research.
And uh, you can tell by the test boom here that it is used for low speed research. Uh, right now it's going to be used for chasing a remotely piloted vehicle called the X-48B. Uh, nevertheless, it's interesting, there's still a place today, as I said, for propellers and even Vietnam veterans. This airplane is the T-38. Uh, it's the Air Force's standard advanced jet trainer, capable of speeds of Mach 1.2. You may have seen it on television chasing the space shuttle in the early days of landing. Uh, I might add I've got about 400 hours from it because it's what we used to chase the SR-71 during the five uh, years that I actually flew the SR-71. It is like flying a sports car on steroids is the best way to put it. This photo is sometimes referred to as the golden age of flight test. It's the hangar in which we're presently standing, which basically is the only known photo that shows all three X-15s together. In addition, on the left side of the hangar, you'll see all the lifting bodies. You will see an F-4 Phantom, which was used for flight research here at Dryden, an F-5D Skylancer, which was a supersonic version of the Sky Ray, and bringing up the rear at the very end, the DC-3, which goes to show that Dryden flight tests everything. The photograph was made and discovered by accident in the 1980s. One of the photographers here was looking through old stock footage and discovered this picture was the last picture on a roll and he suddenly realized what it was as a valuable historical document. So since then it's been preserved. The photo represents truly the golden era of flight tests. It so happens in the 1960s. You'll see an SR-71 here. This SR-71 was the last one that ever flew, actually. It was at the Edwards Open House in October of 1999, and it made its last flyby for the crowd at Mach 3 at about 75,000 feet. Uh, they hoped to do further experimentation here at NASA with the SR, but that didn't come to fruition, so that marked the actual last flight of an SR-71. In a similar fashion, the Lockheed YF-12A Blackbird's ability to sustain Mach 3 cruise speeds allowed NASA to expand its research capabilities and contribute to the SST program. The YF-12 flight research program generated supersonic data on aerodynamics, propulsion, controls, structures, and subsystems. It also provided critical data in other areas such as upper atmosphere physics, noise tests and measurements, materials and handling qualities. One particularly interesting experiment focused on heat transfer and exposed an insulated and chilled hollow cylinder instantly to Mach 3 flight conditions. YF-12 flight research data was complemented by a series of wind tunnel tests, laboratory experiments and analyses. As a result, the combined ground and flight research generated vast amounts of information that was later incorporated into supersonic aircraft design. This has been Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. And I'm Bill Flanagan. I'll see you next time.